Ladies and gentlemen, what a treat we have in store here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show. And arguably, our guest here is considered to be the heart and soul of KOW. And KOW has meant a lot to the UK wrestling scene over the past several years. And many of our guests recently on the Sports Report have come through KOW. And that's why they're going to go on and do bigger and better things. But our guest for over six years was the general manager to KOW, which was home to some of those stars like 2-Bit, like the Cumbrian Outlaw, Rick Marcus, like Sheriff Steele, like King Ryan Grayson. It is a who's who, a long list of people. That is why we're honored to have him here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show. And without further ado here on the Sports Report, the booker, promoter, and the general manager for KOW, that's A. My friend, how are you? I'm doing good. Thanks. That was that was very impressive. That reminded me of some of my uh, some of my ring announcing from uh, from back in the day. You've got you've got good lungs. <laughs> How was your voice hold up after all those intros you did? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Difficult sometimes, especially when I uh, used to be a smoker. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, but yeah, um, some of them were really out there. There was a period where I was a bad guy, so I used to wear uh, ring announce uh, for Chris Ridgeway, and so I did the whole bad guy thing where I'd like list all of his accomplishments you know make it ridiculous and really long to annoy people so sometimes you know I was it was a minute and a half straight of going and going and going so yeah sometimes I get to the end and be like <gasps> and I take a really big <laughs> breath at the end <laughs> I always wondered that because we were talking about that with Ethan last week who was also the general manager of KOW Ethan Edwards and and I was like Ethan how did your voice hold up after all that he said a lot of times you'd have to drink a lot of water so obviously I'm sure yes. that you drink a lot of water and huge shout out to Ethan Edwards who's going to go on and do bigger and better things at Odyssey Pro Wrestling as general manager and of course he did a phenomenal job as ring announcer at KOW so huge shout out to him and everybody else that has been on the show and I'm sure we'll talk about a lot of those guests that we've had on the sports report here on Sportinarium here with you, but for a worldwide audience here on Sportinarium, and it's a tremendous honor to have you on here and arguably without you, I don't know how KOW would have went on and we'll talk about why that's important your role and what you've done for KOW but for a worldwide audience here on Sportinarium listening, talk about KOW and how it all started. So basically KOW, to cut a long story short, there was a promotion in a town near to where we're based. We're based in Pro Furness, which is in the north west of the uk lovingly referred to as the world's biggest cul-de-sac because there's only one way in and one way out and um, we're about two hours drive away from anything else but yeah there was so there's this town near us called ulverston about 10 minutes drive away a promotion started there and me and several of the people who then sell up kow and are still involved with kow today were at that promotion and basically that promotion came to an end the people who were running it didn't want to run wrestling shows anymore and they had a ring they had you know sound system lighting all that stuff that you'd need to run a show so basically we used to run training sessions for this other company and one of the days you know the owners came down they basically like, told us the deal we don't want to run shows anymore we're not interested in it we've got all this stuff we could sell it but we wanted to ask you guys first do you guys want to take it and then you can do your own thing so we all got our heads together and then with the help of the guy who owned the previous company we then got set up as KOW basically obviously we spent time picking a name which was quite a lengthy process and yeah so we then basically moved everything moved the ring from Ulverston to Barrow we found our original venue which was the cemetery cottages we started running training from barrow and then basically from there we started working on our very first show which was in november of 2012 and yeah so i think we had a few months of build so that's basically how we got started and like i say was we sort of rose from the ashes of another company that died and it's sort of always been like a group of friends who started running a wrestling company is basically the simple way to put how kow got started in the first place Talk to me about your memories about that first event you guys put on November in 2012 and what that was like. It was like, it's, 
not to overstay, but it's probably one of the most like important days of my life and, and probably many of the other people are in. We were all obviously very nervous. Arrow had never had a wrestling promotion before. I don't think it's a thing in America, but in the UK, there's these sort of American wrestling, like in inverted commas, companies, you know, that have like the UK Undertaker and like guys in Road Warrior makeup and like that sort of thing. Usually not amazing quality wrestling, to be honest, but you know, it's for a market, it's for kids and families. Shows like that would come to power like once or twice a year, but they never had a promotion. So we were all a bit nervous, obviously all very excited because it was our own thing. We didn't know how well it was going to go. You know, we were like, a ticket's going to sell. We thought it would because we were like, Barrow is starved of this. And, you know, we thought we haven't, you know, there's not really any competition. So it was very nervous. Us, you know, for a lot of the guys wrestling, for us running the show. You know, I can still remember because I was the ring announcer and general manager on that first show. So I remember walking through the curtain for the first time. And at the time, I was very nervous at it. My confidence definitely built over the years but I was very nervous and to be honest it went about as well as it could have gone we had about 200 fans in we pretty much we sold all the tickets which we were over the moon about the crowd really into it despite the fact it was like you know our first ever show and the first time that most of these fans you know some had come over from the previous promotion but most of them had never seen these wrestlers before it went really well you know I can still remember setting the ring up taking the ring down I can sort of remember the atmosphere after the show where everybody was just really happy at how well it had gone I like say you know it was it was a very basic show you know we saw like four singles matches and then a big tag with some of the other guys at the end we kept it very basic because we just didn't it's our first show we want to make sure it goes well but yeah really really well and obviously that's what's led to everything else since and I have to mention as well back then there was another guy who actually was running things I was booking and you know doing the ring announcing general manager and helping out but me and that guy saw of he promoted mainly and we both did the booking so I have to mention him because he sort of did the promotion side for the first year and a half two years so obviously I just have to give him his uh, props for that I don't think he'll want to be named so I won't name him but um, <laughs> just to say that there was somebody else and he he deserves a lot of credit as well of course because he basically did all the legwork he did all the promotion and all that stuff to start with but yeah it was a phenomenal night you know we've still got the footage from that show if people look they can find the a highlight video from that show online if you want to go back and you know see where it all started from you can find that on youtube but yeah it was an awesome show and like say it kick-started everything and obviously we had no idea it was going to go for as long as it has done and, and be as successful as it has been that's something interesting and i want to go back to to it because we all know that KOW has been family friendly wrestling in a lot of ways some of those characters mm -hmm. like the UK Undertaker UK Road Warriors let's say UK Sting as an example in a lot of ways set the tone for family friendly wrestling why is family friendly wrestling that been so important to the success of KOW I think like the thing is, our attitude has always been that, you know, I think some fans look at more family friendly shows, like sort of, they look down their nose a little bit, the sort of smarter fans, you know, the older fans but the thing is, just because the show's family friendly doesn't mean it can't have amazing characters and really great stories and that was what we wanted because the thing is, like say, the vast majority of people, pretty much everyone who started KOW and most of the roster are now involved you know, were born and raised in Barrow or at least, you know, spent a large part of their lives in Barrow and so when we were saying okay we were thinking about what is the show we would have wanted to have gone to as kids because we didn't have the opportunity and we were aware you know in Barrow it's going to be a family crowd you know Manchester Liverpool you know the, the big cities in the UK you are going to get a lot more of those older or those older fans who are proper diehards we were like A we think this is what would be the most successful in Barrow and B we want to create a show that we would have wanted to have gone to as kids because you know like I can remember the things that as a kid made me love wrestling and still mean that I love wrestling to this day and the idea that we could be a platform for local talent and possibly be responsible for you know lifelong wrestling fans was what drove us really and that's why it's so important to us if we want everyone to be able to come you know we don't care if you're six you're 60 you know you're 80 you know we don't care what your background is we want people to come and have a good time and I think we've been successful at that you know we a lot of our crowd is family but you do get you know the lads out on the beers because you know it's Saturday night so some people do come to the show have a few beers watch the show go on a night out and you know sometimes when we've gone out after shows we've seen people from shows around town and they'd be like oh I love the show and they're like oh LP or oh, nightmare or oh, whatever <laughs> um, 
at people. So, you know, that's the thing. And I think that obviously, you know, wrestling shows that are aimed at that older crowd, those are great too. And I, you know, there's several companies that I've been to over the years that present that style. But I think when you're doing family friendly wrestling, you're challenging yourself more because you have to think about what you can do within certain limits. And like it's it's really that emphasis on characters and stories is which is what personally I love most in wrestling. So I think that is why it's it's been so important to us. And that's always been our ethos from day one is we want it to be family friendly, but we don't want that to mean it's not a good show, that it's not entertaining, that there's not good wrestling on it. Because like I say, I think especially with those, you know, American style shows, that is somewhat of the reputation that it gets is that you know it's very simple you know i mean i went to one of those shows when i was i was a kid and obviously not having to go anybody for making money in wrestling obviously if you're making money in wrestling good for you but i went to one of those shows and the best move on the entire show was a drop kick and fair enough the 400 kids and everyone that was in there loved it but me at the time as like a 13 year old 14 year old wrestling fan was like yeah that wasn't a very good show but again you know that's the thing if you're playing to your market and again those kids will have had a great time and they'll have loved it but we were always like don't want family friendly wrestling to be an excuse for not putting on good shows we want to put on the best family friendly shows that we can that is possible to put on Absolutely. Listen, what may work for the Kenny Omega fan may not work for the Bobby Lashley fan. So every crowd and every market is different. But there's something else that's been very important to KOW in the history that you guys have had here so far. And that's you guys also have your own academy or a who's who of wrestlers. And again, several of them who've been on the show here over the past several weeks have trained at it. And talk about the KOW Academy for our worldwide audience listening here on sport and area that may not be familiar with it and why the KLW Academy was so important. Well, I mean, originally when we were running training, obviously, you know, we did publicize it, but originally it was so the guys that did wrestle had somewhere to train, literally just that, because like say, because of where Barrow is, the nearest training school that was running at the time was, you know, at least an hour's drive away, at least, you know, or a two hour train journey or something like that. So, and obviously people can do that, but you know, it's a, you know, if it's a three hour training session, an hour, an hour, you know, it's a lot of time. So originally it was just so the people we had in our original shows had somewhere to train and try and improve as time went on we did start to get different people coming in the way to train and as you know some of our guys you know Craig Collins Chris Ridgway people like that who were going and training elsewhere and getting more opportunities and they were learning more they would bring what they had learned to the training sessions and the reason we wanted to have that and wanted to promote it was a because it you know it does support us financially certainly in that you know people pay a fee every week you know that's cool you know most of the time it just covers you know our storage costs we're not in it for profit at all but you know any money that comes into the company is put into making the company better but and it was also important to us that we always wanted to promote local talent that was the whole point everything was our roster is mainly from Barrow, you know, some other people from different places, but generally, you know, it's the Northwest, it's it's Barrow specifically. And we wanted to give people, again, young wrestling fans like we were, you know, a few years earlier, somewhere where, you know, if somebody was like, oh, I'd love to go and wrestle and, you know, I watch Raw every week and John Cena is my favorite or Batista is my favorite <laughs> or whatever, somewhere to go and train. It's definitely has picked up steam over the years. You know, some people come and go, some people come and train and don't train anymore, but are still part of like extended KOW family and come to shows and help set up and do security and stuff but as time went on you know you do quickly realize who your sort of serious trainees are and who the people who might only be there for a cup of coffee and then we'll go but you know it's, it's been very important over the years you know since we've started you know some of our biggest stars and some of our biggest success stories have come from the academy you know Sherry Steele was the very first graduate you know he basically blazed the trail for every academy graduate that came after him you know he was a heavyweight champion he was a tag champion he did incredibly well Rick Marcus was the second guy to come along again you know, he's done an amazing job then the most recent would be um, of course Will Carter Lucas Neon and Tubit who again have all done an amazing job have all gone out and done other things so I'd say it's been incredibly important it keeps things fresh and um, you know because some of our guys have wrestled on every single show for seven years so you know it gives people fresh opponents it gives our fans fresh faces to get behind and it, it keeps things moving forwards and the best thing is is these guys you know Tubit five years years ago was the one getting trained and then you know obviously before lockdown happened he was then training people so people literally go full circle from being a trainee and learning the ropes to actually then
then leading sessions and being somebody passing on knowledge to the next generation of you know KOW wrestlers who are hopefully going to come through the ranks. Well, we know that they are definitely going to come through the ranks and some. And you bring up Two Bit, and we had on the main event a few weeks ago, and he's somebody that really excites me in the ring. And we talked with a number of different people now over the past several weeks about Two Bit, but you're probably the person that knows him as good as anybody would ever know him when it comes to his career and how he started out. I mean, talk to me about Two Bit, the early beginnings, and how do you feel on his career and how it's progressed now? Yeah, I mean, the coolest thing about Tubit is I've literally watched him grow up. Like, he started training when he was, I think, 13, I want to say. So, you know, so he came, he was a young lad. You wouldn't believe it from seeing him in the ring, but quite shy, reserved you know, not the loudest guy in the room, whereas when you see him in the ring, he's the loudest, most obnoxious guy, you know, for a couple of miles. But yeah, obviously obviously he's changed a lot. He's worked really hard. You know, he's paid all his dues. He was there every training session, setting the ring up, taking it down, busting his ass to get better. You know, I mean, to be completely honest, he was ready for shows before we let him on shows. And that was purely because we just sort of set a rule for ourselves that was when you and Lucas Nee and Will Carr as well, we were like, when you're 16, that's when you can be on shows. We don't on shows before then, but when you're 16, you can be on shows. Honestly, he was probably ready six months, maybe even to a year before he got on a show, which again, I think actually really benefited him because it gave him more time to find who he was and get more comfortable. And then, you know, ever since he's come up, he's just gotten better and better and better, um, you know, match on match. He, he improves constantly. He works ridiculously hard to a ridiculous degree to the point that I'm in awe of him at times. You know, he, he had his debut match again with Lucas Neon and Will Carter. They had a triple threat. Those three are kind of, I think, always going to be especially in KOW you know if you mention one of them the other two's names will be very quickly following them but yeah you know they had their debut we actually um, fun story all of their family are big parts of KOW you know Will's mum makes wrestle buddies for us like knits them and gives them to us to sell she sends packed lunches for the boys to the shows you know sandwiches and <laughs> crisps and sausage rolls and cakes and stuff for the lads you know Lucas Neon's dad puts some pain he's wrestled and he's done security and he's been you know all like say all of the family has been involved somewhere in KOW so we decided what would be cool is let's surprise the parents let's not let them know we didn't announce the match we didn't say we were going to do it I remember going up to the lads and saying right you're a debuting on the next show we're not telling your parents I want to surprise them <laughs> so you're going to be backstage if they ask why you're not doing security tell them that you're going to listen to you know guys put their matches together and blah you know we made us some excuse you know the definition of a locker room set out our own venue the cottages we used to start the ring in sort of a little side room and there was like like four lads all huddled in that corner. I was sat at the sound desk watching. There was lads peeking under the curtain in the back because literally everyone in KOW wide see this match because we'd all, you know, some of us since they started, some of us for a year or so, they absolutely smashed it. It was an awesome match. It got this is awesome, Dan, which isn't super common in KOW. You know, they did an amazing job. And yeah, two bits just kept getting better and better. And he doesn't rest on his laurels. He's always evolving. The two bit that debuted three years ago is not the same two bit of a year later or the same in two bitters now and I think that's a real credit to him is he's constantly evolving his character he's constantly changing his you know wrestling style and improving it and tweaking it and making things better because some guys you know will get their stuff down and be like right that's it and they'll coast on that but he's always looking to get better he's always looking to improve and you know his last year in KOW I think he main evented two I want to say two out of five shows maybe even three I might be wrong but yeah so he was really on the rise and the show that was cancelled right before COVID he was meant to actually wrestle for the heavyweight title for the first time which sort of would have been his crowning achievement but yeah you know I know he's been working really hard in lockdown I have I literally haven't seen him since November 2019 which sucks uh, obviously we keep in contact but I haven't seen him in person since then but yeah I'm really excited for when things open up again A for KOW and just to see him obviously because you know obviously he's a good friend but yeah you know he's he's a real credit to be completely honest and if he goes to a company and they say where are you training and he says KOW I feel very good about that and well, that makes KOW look really good because he is an absolute credit He's super professional, works really hard, great attitude. I can't say enough enough good things about him, to be honest. And we agree with you 1,000% on that because 2-Bit is somebody, again, I've said it now a few times on the air here on Sporting Air. He's going to be just like a Jeff Hardy, just like a Shawn Michaels, where you can tell that this guy is destined for big things. I mean, you think about who he is in such a short amount of time, how far he's come. Like you said, he was showcase champion, he's main evented, and we saw that right before COVID he was going to be 
in the main event. Who knows? He might have even won the KO Heavyweight Championship. And I have a very good feeling that one day he will win not only the KOW Heavyweight Championship, but several other heavyweight championships and titles out there in several different promotions across only the UK, but certainly in the world. And these are some of the reasons why we are honored to have on the Sports Report the number one global sports show, arguably the heart and soul of KOW. And that's Booker, promoter, and the general manager for KOW. And that's A. As I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryson. For more information on the Sports Report, you can go to sportsreportx.com. And to listen to all of our archives, you can go to soundcloud.com slash the Sports Report 2019. And now go on our YouTube page by subscribing to the Sports Report, the number one global sports show where you can get sports report related content. And there's always a huge shout out to the entire team here at Sport and Area, including Lakey, R, Sean, who does a great job with the YouTube page. Connor, Martin, our old friend Mike Lipinski with the In the Fight show, Susie, Sasha, Dale, Dave, Steve, Richie, everybody at Sportinarium that has made us the number one global sports show. And for more information on Sportinarium, you can follow Sportinarium on Twitter and Instagram at Sportinarium. You can like Sportinarium on Facebook at Sportinarium Media. And you can subscribe to the aforementioned Sportinarium TV YouTube page where you can see a who's who of KOW wrestling alums like the Cumbrian outlaw Rick Marcus like the main event two bit by subscribing to at Sportinarium TV for sports report related interviews and some of the other many great shows that we have here on Sportinarium and most importantly you can listen to the sports report Fridays Saturdays and Sundays 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK time Fridays to Sundays on Sportinarium.com that's Sportinarium.com Fridays to Sundays 6 to 8 p.m. Eastern time 10 p.m p.m. to 12 a.m. UK time, Fridays to Sundays, and 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. You can hear Sportinarium content from the many, many great shows in addition to the Sports Report. So you know what you need to do? Sportinarium.com. Listen anytime and listen to the Sports Report, Fridays to Sundays, 6 to 8 p.m., 10 p.m. to 12 a.m. UK time, because you never know who we're going to have on. So we're probably going to have somebody else from KOW, I'm sure, in the near and distant future here. And most importantly, we're talking all things related to KOW, one of our favorite promotions, one of the top wrestling promotions around in the UK, and that is the heart and soul of KOW. That is Mr. ALP, who has done a phenomenal job, and he's been there since day one. So there's nobody that knows KOW better than ALP, and that's why we're honored to have him here on the Sports Report to talk all things related to KOW. And ALP, I got to ask you then, what got you into wrestling? So I had a very gradual um, introduction into the world of pro wrestling. You know, when I was a kid, the very first wrestling I saw was, I think it was a SummerSlam. And all I can remember is there was some sort of, and again, I was very young at this time, probably like six or seven. But all I remember is there was some sort of like bikini contest, much like there was back in the day. And it was the show where Mimi Young showed up and exposed herself. And that was how the segment ended. That is technically my first memory of wrestling, which is kind of messed up but like I said that was when I was very young and then as I got older I had a friend in school called Nathan shout out to him if he's listening I doubt he is but <laughs> if he is shout out to Nathan and basically he had you know how like every, most people have like a cool uncle his yeah. cool uncle would bring when he came to visit like old WWF tapes like you know Hulk Hogan era the Summer Slams, the Wrestlemanias so we watched some of them the first match that I remember like realising sort of oh there's, there's something about this wrestling the one that sort of first caught my imagination Imagination was Macho Man and Ricky the Dragon Steamboat at WrestleMania 3, which still holds up today, it's still an amazing match. And then, so like I said, again, that was very gradual, you know, it'd be once every two or three months he'd come, there'd be a new tape. We'd watch the new tape, and then that'd be it. And then as we got older, SmackDown in the UK used to air on, like, they'd repeat it on Sunday mornings, like the sort of kid-friendly edit of it, or whatever you want to call it. So that was sort of when I first started regularly watching wrestling. But both my parents are Christian, and I went to church for until I was about 15. So on numerous occasions when I was a kid, you know, Sunday morning and roll around, and be like, oh, mum, my tummy's not feeling very good, or, <laughs> um, oh, I think I've got a cold coming, mum. Like, I don't think I can go to church. 
church and they'd be like, okay, right, well, you stay here and we'll go to church. Or they'd get in the car, they'd go off to church, straight away, door open. He only lived around the corner, run around the corner, go in, and then me and Nathan would watch SmackDown. And then as soon as it was all, I would sprint back home and, you know, get back in bed. And, oh, I, I am feeling a little bit better now. Yeah, actually, I might go and play football with my mates later or whatever. Um, so that happened a lot. But yeah, so, you know, basically the person who made me fall in love with wrestling was Eddie Guerrero. There was a lot of people and it was such a good time again in wrestling you know it was like I think it was just after or around the period of you know the Smackdown 6 that time frame you know Rey Mysterio I loved and you know a lot of the cruiserweights Brock Lesnar Kurt Angle but my guy is and always has been Eddie Guerrero to the point where I actually have a tribute to him now but yeah Eddie was the guy who made me fall in love with wrestling I remember the build up to his title match with Lesnar and No Way Out but obviously at this time I was like 11 or 12 so obviously I wasn't staying up till 4am in the UK to watch the pay-per-view so I can remember going around my friend's house again the internet was a thing but again we were 11 so you know we weren't regularly going on the internet like kids are nowadays so again we had no clue we'd watched the Smackdown the final Smackdown before it we knew Eddie was going to be wrestling for the title we knew he was wrestling Brock we knew when it was happening and we showed up and we were like started the show and I can't remember I need to go back and watch it I've been meaning to for years but obviously I can't remember how exactly I imagine he probably started the show like Eddie's won but I can still remember us running around his living room and jumping up and down and his mum coming downstairs to tell us to shut up because it was 10 o'clock on a Sunday morning and half the house was trying to sleep um, but yeah I can still remember being super excited about that so yeah and then I fell out of it for a little while sort of when me and Nathan sort of stopped hanging out as much and then I got back into it again with a couple of other my friends one of whom Clinton uh, who is one of our referees uh, started watching it with him again and that was when I properly got into it but yeah like I said the, the two things I always credit is Macho Man and Ricky Steamboat for you know like being the match to maybe go like wow this is really cool you know and this is really impressive and athletic and dramatic and then like say Eddie Guerrero was the guy that I fell in love with was you know my guy and one of the like probably the greatest of all time in my opinion or at least in the conversation to be on the, the Mount Rushmore of wrestling as far as I'm concerned oh absolutely no question about it listen I gotta post a picture of my Eddie Guerrero WCW Tops wrestling card then one of these days because Eddie Guerrero listen I watched him quite a bit and then growing up for me I'm a little older than you not by much but I'm a little older than you and I watched the whole through the Attitude Era and then later on into Ruthless Aggression and even WCW so for me growing up and I've said this on a number of different shows with some of the guests that that we've had on that were in KOW, like the country network Rick Marcus, said that, listen, for me, I would go back and forth between Nitro and Raw. It was Thunder, and it was SmackDown, and it was ECW. So that was a great time to get into wrestling, as you first alluded to when you were six or seven, right around 99, 2000. And then right into even past the Attitude Era, there was still a lot of great wrestlers. You had Kurt Angle, Eddie Guerrero, Rey Mysterio, Brock Lesnar, Chris Jericho, Christian Edge. It was a lot of great wrestlers that was. So I could certainly see why you got into it, but I want to ask you also this question because I get the sense that the wrestling scene has exploded in demand, even during the pandemic, and especially here in the North. And you're somebody that understands wrestling. You've been in the business now a while. You've seen the success that KOW has had. Why do you think that the wrestling scene here in the UK, especially in the North, has exploded with interest even during the pandemic? And why has that continued? I think it's honestly because obviously for the history of sort of British wrestling, you know, the glory days for a very long time was the world of sport era you know obviously that was a big deal and then that died and then that was sort of when wrestling had its lull there was still a lot of great talent in the uk you know a lot of whom now in the boom had still unfortunately haven't got the due um, that they deserve but I think it was a combination of things I think it was wrestling at that time in general I think was starting to pick up a little bit in interest again and I think it was there was a new generation of new wrestlers so there was sort of the I don't want to say the old guard but there was the, you know the Joey Hayes is the the Chris Travis is you know that sort of group of uh, you know the rock star spuds that sort of era of wrestlers who'd been sort of holding down the fort and keeping things going and then I think it was probably, you know, within around that sort of 2010 to 2012 mark where a lot of wrestling fans who were fans you know from either who were very young during the Attitude Era or you know during the like you know the sort of the era I grew up in and that's when they started breaking into it and I think like say it was, it was a combination of wrestling as a whole going through a bit of a, a little bit of an upswing during that time and then there was just so much talent coming up and then obviously that's when you see a lot of the you know progress started I want to say the same year that we did you know and a lot of those companies that are now a big deal and are now look to you know some of them did start 
that around that time. I think progress was definitely a big part of it. Preston City Wrestling was a big part of it at the time because they sort of started popularizing the bringing in imports from America and a mix of indie talent and sort of older, you know, WWE, WCW talent. I think it was just that there was a scene crying out for it, but there wasn't anybody providing what, you know, what it wanted or not. There wasn't enough of a platform. And like I said, when there was that general upswing and then with these promotions coming to existence at about the same time, it meant that all these new fans were like, oh, well, you're okay. WWE's cool but it's in America the majority of the time you know what's around here and I think the rise of the internet was obviously a, a big help you know with obviously having cat caught on a lot more so it's a lot easier to promote and reach fans uh, further afield you know now you get fans who travel from other parts of Europe to come to UK wrestling shows you know people who travel the length of the country you know people are at shows every weekend and so I think it's that those you know passionate fans these fans who grew up in these amazing years of wrestling you know that were maybe like say young and then when they got to the age where oh, I'm working now and I've got money I've got disposable income I can go and spend money on wrestling so I think it was all of those things combined and I think with lockdown it's obviously been a bad thing in a lot of ways but it's also a really good thing because when wrestling does come back it's going to be insane everyone's going to be absolutely ravenous for it because obviously there's been some shows you know obviously Progress have run some shows Rev Pro have run some shows you know obviously no fans and taking a lot of safety precautions and stuff but you know the last wrestling show I went to was WXW 16 Carat in Germany which I actually organised for a friend of mine Stag do and that was March last year now so it's now over a year so you know even fans who were going to shows right before lockdown it's been an entire year and for those you know diehard fans who live for it you know and even the fans that might only go to one promotion I know there's fans in Barrow who are dying to you know come to a KOW show again and you know I'm dying to run a show and go to shows as a fan again so I think as much as it's a bad thing I think that when it is back I think people are going to appreciate a lot more like say those first few shows like I think every promotion's first show back is going to be insane I think the people are going to be ravenous for it all the wrestlers are going to be you know going at 110% giving everything to it and I think it's going to be as much as it sucks not being able to go to wrestling shows and run wrestling shows I think when it's back it's almost going to be worth it with like say how hot all those shows are going to be and how into it everybody's going to be absolutely no question about it we've even seen here in the states how we've seen some companies now have resumed and they've had fans and you see that enthusiasm and you see that demand. So I can only imagine what it's going to be like in a few months when wrestling resumes here in the UK for promotions like KOW. But you said something interesting, ALP, and I want to get your perspective on it because I think it's a different perspective than anybody else that we've had on the show here. And I'd like you to talk about it for our worldwide audience here in Sport and Arium, is that You just mentioned that you're a promoter and we introduced you obviously as a booker and promoter. And I was curious on if you watch wrestling different than let's say the average person or even a wrestler themselves because you're looking at it in terms of how the wrestler wrestled that match in terms of a number of different factors and then as a promoter you're obviously worried about how the event does you're worried about who's on the card and making everything go safe and soundly and smoothly so I was curious on if you watch wrestling different let's say versus the average person yeah I'd say that I definitely do sometimes it's to my detriment as a fan to be completely honest but I do look at matches and booking and that and those sorts of things on a much more analytical level and definitely from having conversations with you know like Chris Ridgway and other people in wrestling you know if you're looking at purely a wrestler as their ability in the ring it's not the moves that you tell who is the show who is a good wrestler it's the little things it's the transitions it's the way they move it's the way they carry themselves that is who who is actually a good wrestler you know somebody can do you know a 450 and that'll look cool but like that won't to me say that that guy's a good wrestler it'll say that guy can do that move that move's cool but you know if if they look awkward in the ring if they move around in a slightly off way and it's very hard to describe to people sometimes how it is but you know I've been to shows with friends of mine who aren't involved in wrestling you know like I am like my friends in KOW are and you know we'll watch a match and they'll be raving about it like that was amazing and I'm sort of like you know obviously I don't want to rain on their parade like yeah it was good but it wasn't <laughs> you know as amazing as you guys are saying it is and that sort of thing and, it, and it's the same with booking as well you know I'm always I'm sort of always scouting you know even when I am at a show to watch or even if it's somebody that I'm like I'd probably never get the chance to book this person but you know whenever I go to a show I'm looking at it with in the back of my mind there's that little thing that's saying yeah I'd use this person or this person would be cool for that or you know if, if people do different storylines you know I've definitely cherry picked bits and pieces of different promotions I've seen or seen 
yeah. an element of someone's character and been like, oh, if somebody from, I'll mention this to somebody at KW, because, you know, obviously not like, you know, taking somebody's entire character or anything, but like maybe a little mannerism or a little, you know, attitude or something from them and be like, oh, well, this guy does this little thing or something like that and suggest it to people. So definitely I do look at it a lot more critically, but I think that also makes it a lot more enjoyable for me when there is a match that I do just get completely lost in or that does completely catch my emotions because it is a lot rarer. Not saying that, you know, there aren't a lot of good matches, but a lot of the time, you know, it's like, I think my upper percentile is a lot smaller than over, like you say, the average fans. But at the same time, it's cool going to those shows with people like that because their enthusiasm rubs off on me as well. But yeah, definitely, you know, I'm always, you know, I've always got that promoter's hat on, you know, of thinking, oh, well, this guy's good. And it's just learning. That's the thing as well. The thing with wrestling is obviously there's so many different views on it. You got to attend different promotions that all have a different opinion on how things should be booked and how shows should be run and those sorts of things. So it's always trying to learn and bring things back to then ultimately put into KOW and make things better. Whether that be right, I want to book this guy in the future, or whatever it be, or they did, you know, this little presentational thing, we could do that, or they did this little note in a storyline or a little thing in a promo and thinking, yeah, that's something that I can take on. And sometimes I'll see something at a show and I won't use it five years later, you know, or, you know, much after the fact. But wrestling is so broad. There's so many different styles. There's so many different schools of thought that even just watching wrestling, you can learn a lot and, you know, or at least get a greater appreciation for how other people do things. So yeah, definitely when I'm watching wrestling, I think differently from the average wrestling fan. Oh, I'm sure of that. And listen, wrestling is like Baskin Robbins. You get 31 flavors and every flavor is going to taste different. So listen to what one fan might be great to another fan fan it may not be to one wrestling company something might be great to another it may not work so i think that's what the beauty of the wrestling business is there's so many different choices out there and i think that that's why we're very excited to see the future of the wrestling business and i was also curious then as you mentioned chris ridgeway just before and here's a somebody in chris ridgeway that is one of the top wrestlers around in the uk and he's even made a name for himself here in the states a number of different people that we you've spoken with his name obviously has come up and why has chris ridgeway been somebody that has been one of the standouts in the history of kow yeah, well, I mean, you know, as well as being an incredibly successful wrestler, you know, Chris is, is also my best friend. He's my brother from another mother, if you want to use that terminology. <laughs> um, you know, the uncle to his recently born child. We've been there for each other through high points and low points. You know, I've been with him basically through his whole wrestling journey. So, I, you know, I just have to mention that first. You know, like, obviously, I will happily talk about him as a wrestler in a second, but I can still remember that he was one of the first people involved with KOW. He was involved with the pre previous promotion so he is one of the pillars of KOW you know he's one of the true originals he, he's passed on so much knowledge that he went out and learned to the two bits the Rick Marxes the Sheriff Steels and I'm sure they will tell you themselves they wouldn't be where they were without Chris obviously other people in KOW as well but they wouldn't be where they are but Chris basically started to break out you know he started getting booked elsewhere I think I went to his second ever outside booking with him to watch that show and he started to blow up and it got to the point where he realised that if he really wanted to make a go of it you know to do this full time and make a living at it he was going to have to move away from Barrow so he decided he was going to you know move back to Liverpool which is where his family was and where he was originally you know born and then moved to Barrow later on you know and the last time I was going to see him was at a KW show so you know I can still remember the show I remember afterwards you know all the crowd had gone home the ring was coming down we were stood backstage you know we had a hug said bye we loved each other for the first time you know so me Chris and KW were like you know permanently linked you know forever you know we've both got the kow logo tattooed on us uh, along with a couple of our other friends that's a bond we'll always have but you know chris like say wrestled on the very first show you know he you know he'd hate to look back on that show now because he's come so far but you know i say i went to his, his first outside bookings you know i went to some of the first times he worked for some of the biggest companies in the uk you know he was one of the first people he spoke to about the fact that he was going to be going to wrestle for pro wrestling nowhere you know and i've known him since I was 18 so you know over a decade now we've been friends and even when I first met him I knew that going to Japan and especially pro wrestling Noah was always his dream you know from the get go so that was amazing I got to watch him wrestle live for pro wrestling Noah actually at work messaged me to be like oh they're doing a live show and I went on my break and watched it in the break room at work so yeah you know and in terms of KOW like say he's been incredibly important you know he hasn't been on show, our shows in a while but again that's because he's been so successful he's, he's gone so much work we just haven't 
haven't had the opportunity. But yeah, you know, KOW wouldn't be where he is without him. You know, he was the winner of the first Road to Gold tournament. You know, he, he's still our longest reigning heavyweight champion ever. He's been instrumental in the vast majority of our, our trainees. And I know that he's continuing to take on that role elsewhere. You know, obviously, again, I'm biased, but I think he's the best wrestler in the UK. That's my opinion. Again, I appreciate that I'm a bit biased, but that's my opinion. <laughs> I think, you know, the sky's the limit for him. You know, I'm incredibly proud of him, which, you know, I, I tell him as often as I can. Oh, and again, to see him grow and improve, you know, like say he's literally lived out his dreams, which is awesome, you know, and I'm, I'm hoping that when things are back to normal, that, you know, if he does go back to Japan, we've talked about, you know, I want to go over there while he's over there and then um, to the country with him and go to the different cities and watch him wrestle there. Because when I saw him wrestle in that ring, you know, in Japan, in, in far nowhere, like say, come you always worked to wrestle for, like say, sign work, you know, I'm not going to lie, a couple of tears were shed. So yeah, you know, he, he's been incredibly important to KOW incredibly important to me as a person as well and yeah like I say one of the best one of the most reliable nicest people in the UK and I know he's been instrumental in many other people you know improving you know getting better he's all about passing on knowledge to other people and yeah you know I want to get him back to Barrow as soon as is possible but you know when life changes you know when you get older people move apart thankfully now he lives a lot closer to me so I get to see him on a, a lot more regular basis but yeah you know incredibly important for KOW's history and you know I think the British wrestling scene as a whole now and again he's doing incredibly well he's you know obviously been wrestling on these shows of progress recently which is awesome because you know obviously I've had numerous conversations with him about him struggling and you know not being able to work in that way you know like a lot of British wrestlers have had but yeah like I say one of the pillars of KOW you know incredibly important again you know if there was a Mount Rushmore of KOW he'd be on that you know he'd be one of the first names on that list and speaking of Mount Rushmore of KOW I gotta think also on that list is Sheriff Steele. And we're going to miss Sheriff Steele wrestling in KOW because, again, Sheriff Steele is right up there with Chris Ridgway. And he's a guy that you just mentioned a little while ago also. So he's a name we've talked about quite a bit. I'm sure you heard what Ethan had to say about Sheriff Steele. And obviously, we know the rivalry he had with Rick Marcus, the Cumbrian outlaw. So I got to ask you then, speaking of Mount Rushmore, Sheriff Steele and what made him the ruler of the Iron Fist of KOW and some? So yeah, I mean, Sheriff had, I mean, I think the coolest thing about KOW for me as a booker is, and what's most interesting to me in wrestling, is seeing characters change and evolve and grow. And I think Sheriff Steele is the perfect example of that. When he first started, he was a security guard. And where how he was originally introduced was we had a wrestler called the Creeper at the time, big, scary monster, terrified all the kids, you know, that sort of a character. And the first time it happened was just the Creeper dragged him into the ring and attacked him. And that eventually <laughs> turned into, you know, Steele wanting to get his revenge and that was a whole little storyline and he started training and then he went into he had like a best of three series or like a trial series where he'd have three matches and if he won one he'd earn a contract and in a bit of poetic justice as often happens in KOW his last match happened to be against the Creeper and he actually won and got his contract and then he was Gabriel Steele for a little while and I think he was still finding his place he was like right I'm Gabriel Steele I've got this name but who is this person you know what am I and then eventually he did did become Sheriff Steel, which was basically the way that happened was that he was sick of he'd been beaten down and attacked and he'd see other people getting beaten down and unfairly attacked or blindsided or cheated and he'd say right somebody needs to uphold justice in this company and that was when he took on the Sheriff Steel mantle and you know started wearing the aviator shades and the baseball cap and bringing the cuffs and the sort of nightstick and that sort of thing to the ring with him you know and I think that's when he really found himself and the moment that I knew that that character worked was I can't remember the exact show but it was basically a bad guys were beating up a good guy a big dramatic moment and at the time Craig Collins was the champion and obviously a champion especially when they're a good guy is usually the most popular guy you know in the company if that's what you're going for so this is happening they're getting beat down I'm at ringside because again I'm still you know general manager ring announcer at this point so I'm at ringside and before the crowd started chanting for Craig Collins they started chanting for Sheriff Steele because by this point they knew if somebody was going to stand up for justice it was going to be Sheriff Steele and I think that was the moment that myself and Sheriff Steele were like yeah this has worked the people get it they understand it and that's how it worked and then you know I mean he's done so much his initial feud with Rick Marcus which again sort of helped cement him you know that was really personal and heated and ended in a big Sheriff Rules match at our, I think I want to say the fourth anniversary show that sounds right the fourth anniversary show and that was a really got really personal Rick Bob you know the Sheriff's daughter and stuff like that and that was really personal and then obviously I have to mention as well Royal Justice the team that you found with King Ryan Grayson sort of an, an odd bedfellow sort of situation because King Ryan Grayson is one of the most you know despised 
nice people in the company at that point. And eventually, Sheriff was so good that he managed to turn Ryan to the, the good side of the force, if you want to use that terminology. <laughs> um, you know, they went on. I mean, basically, those two convinced me that we should have a tag division. Um, so, you know, th- there was that as well. They started teaming. They had some replica WWE title belts that they, like, put the KW logo on and stuff. And that was sort of my little test run i wanted to feel things out like it won't be a sanctioned title it makes sense because you guys are like quite comedic and light-hearted so we can sort of introduce the idea without properly committing to it and then i think they had those for about i think it was a year i think they had those i want to say and then again another fun story you'll learn from this that i love surprising people but we then decided me and a couple of the other guys we run things you know on a sort of day basis show to show basis i was like right i think we should get some tag titles now so we you know bought some tag belts we didn't tell what was happening we told them there was going to be some sort of segment Ethan was the uh, this was when Ethan was the general manager I want to say I think it was just when he'd become general manager for KOW and so yeah we hid the titles backstage we didn't tell them and then Ethan was like you know you've been champions for a year you know you've done really well we want to announce that they're now officially sanctioned titles which they knew that was what they knew was happening we were going to say they're sanctioned titles but they didn't know they were getting proper belts and then one of our referees brought them from the back surprised them Ryan Grace and I should not turn Turned away from the crowd and said, you expletives and um, because he was quite shocked and yeah that introduced the tag championships and then of course that then led into sort of the final feud for rick and the sheriff i mean this is the thing this this feud was so interwoven so many other things happened you know rick was the champion and he won it first and he eventually lost it and then his whole thing was he was obsessed with getting it back and then he won the road to gold tournament which would get him a guaranteed title shot against nightmare who's the champion at the time so he's finally back where he wanted to be and then who should show up his old rival Sheriff Steele with the Vertigo <laughs> briefcase then entitled to a title shot it's a triple threat match so Rick's furious and what makes him even more furious is the Sheriff then wins the title so now Sheriff is tag champion and heavyweight champion he's got both belts he's top of the world one of Rick's oldest rivals has beaten him and stopped him <laughs> from getting his title back that leads into Rick absolutely brutalizing Royal Justice with a steel chair again ironically Sheriff gets cashed in on earlier in the night he'd lost his tag titles he gets cashed in on Taylor West steals his heavyweight title and then Sheriff vanishes he just goes dark for the rest of the year nobody sees him nobody's heard from him Grayson doesn't know where he is and then finally uh, that year's road to gold Rick was in the final was just about to cheat to win Sheriff comes back they have a big massive brawl everyone went crazy when Sheriff came back and they had their big blow off match which was another Sheriff Rules match of the anniversary show loser retires like you alluded to and because shockingly and we've still not got any resolution to this you know like nearly 18 months later Grayson turned his back on Sheriff him with a steel chair handed Rick the win and Rick retired the Sheriff so yeah it seems like the Sheriff's done in knockout wrestling which is obviously a real shame everybody was you know heartbroken about that the reaction in the room I don't know if you've seen the clip when it happened but if you go back on KW social media it's there and the gasp the shock the disbelief in the room that Grayson would do that to Steele after two years of teaming together and being the first ever tag champions was in- insane but it's professional wrestling you know part of me thinks that you know I don't think we will never see the sheriff again obviously he's retired so I, I don't he seems like we'll see him in a wrestling ring but I'm sure I'm sure his face will appear on a show somewhere at some point in the future I don't think sheriff is going to take it lying down and I don't think it'll be the last we see of him maybe maybe it'll be the last I mean, it might be the last time we've seen him wrestling but if I know sheriff and I feel like I do I wouldn't be surprised if, if he shows up at some point who knows when it'll be you know I wouldn't want to be Rick Marcus or Ryan Grayson whenever he does show back up listen I wouldn't be surprised if we saw Sheriff Steele in NXT if we saw him in WWE and AEW because he's meant that much to KOW so we certainly hope that we haven't seen the last of Sheriff Steele and what a wrestler he was and how much he meant to KOW he's right up there in Mount Rushmore but you also said something else and I want to go into that because you were also an on-screen character and we've of alluded to that but we talked more about you on the booking and the promoting end and even dived into some of your ring announcing but you were an on-screen character in KOW for many many years and the majority of the time that KOW has been in existence you have been an on-screen character and you mentioned Ethan took over as general manager he had replaced you and what was that experience like in terms of being an on-screen character and especially an on-screen character that was in so many of the storylines that are important to the history of KOW 
about you. So for our worldwide audience here on Sportinarium, talk about your experiences of being the general manager in KOW. Yeah, I mean, it was an incredible experience. Like I said, when I first started, you know, I wasn't, my confidence definitely improved over time and got a lot better, but I've got to do a lot of cool things. You know, Teddy Long was a big influence on me, holler holler and all that. Uh, he was the general <laughs> manager of Smackdown. I love Teddy Long. If anybody says a bad word about Teddy Long, I'll happily cuss them out for it. Teddy's the best. <laughs> So it was cool getting to be general manager because like Teddy Long was general manager and he was cool. Even as a kid, I was like, he's cool because he's the guy who gets to be like, well, you're wrestling this guy and this is happening. And I always thought that was a cool thing. And I think that's why I gravitated towards more the creative and the booking side of things, you know, with wrestling. But yeah, you know, I've got to do some really cool stuff. I've been attacked more than once. That's not fun. But um, I mean, it's cool to look back on. It'll be something that I'll look back on and, you know, this happened to me. And, you know, I've been RKO'd. I've been super kicked. I've been punched in the face with a steel chain and stuff like that. I've been a special guest referee in the middle of the when the whole triad storyline which was going on, which was a massive storyline for KOW. You know, I was fairly involved with that. You know, I've got to ring announce. I've got to, I've got to do so many cool things. You know, it's hard to, you know, just think of a couple or a handful of them just because, like I say, there's, there's been so many things. But yeah, you know, staggering it, it was my childhood dream like that is the thing KOW is it for me like that is what I wanted when I was a kid like say I want to be Teddy Long as much as I thought it'd be cool to be a wrestler I was like well that's the guy with the power that's the guy who says you get a title shot or you're gonna wrestle him or you know comes out and put things right and that was always very cool to me as a kid so yeah I've got to do lots of stuff and then I got to be a corrupt and evil GM as well which was also a whole bunch of fun and that's what led to Ethan replacing me was because I got too evil and drunk with power and eventually that resulted <laughs> in me you know Enticed by my own petard and that sort of thing but yeah it's it's a really cool role to have you know i was always wary of not being more involved than i needed to be in storylines because obviously the main focal point of the show should be the wrestlers which is why anytime i've ever got the upper hand on a wrestler it's always been with some sort of a weapon or you know like a kendo stick was sort of my signature go-to thing when the time is called for it but yeah you know i've got to cut promos in the ring you know across from one of my best friends you know we've got to go back and forth with each other you know taylor west that was part of the trial storyline got to have an in-ring confrontation you know i've got to get in the thick of the action you know i've run out last minute to counter dramatic knee fall you know as general manager you know a lot of these big cool things in wrestling i've got to do via doing that and, and also you know it, again when we did that triad storyline and um, i was still very unsure of things and you know you'd come out and you get a nice you know a nice little clap people are like yeah he's the ring announcer yeah where, where to go you know just just very nice sort of golf claps polite respectful boxing not the reactions of the wrestlers again which is absolutely fine but you know still to this day i can remember the reaction basically the triads are to cut it very very short was triad was an invading group taylor west led the chris ridgeway was in it dan maloney chris brooks nightmare was in it for a time the big massive feud these guys are invading they want to take over the company went for a very long time and finally the the big blow off was going to be there's going to be Ridgeway who was the triads champ, you know he was heavyweight champion he was the triads main guy versus Craig Collins who had been a bad guy for a long time and turned good to fight for KOW and you know he was the hottest guy in the company he just won the road to gold tournament and they were going to have this massive 30 minute Ironman match where if Ridgeway wins I leave and West gets my job and takes over the company whereas if Collins wins the triad this bands you know west has to leave the company so a huge match you know we've been building this for a year and a half two years at this point so part of the match you know it's very dramatic it's tied. I think it's about 20 minutes in. Ridgeway and Collins, you know, are exhausted, roll out of the ring. West gets in because he wants to get involved. And I get in as well with a kendo stick. And obviously the plan was, you know, I'm going to hit him with a kendo stick. We get because West wasn't wrestling at the time either. So we were both sort of the non wrestling figureheads of both groups. And again, I was very nervous about it because I was like, I'm not a wrestler. Like, are people going to care? Am I going to get in there? And there's going to be cricket. So, you know, there is like, why is, the, <laughs> why is this guy in the ring? Like, we're here watch the wrestling match. But and again, I think it was because people knew I was an underdog and I wasn't a wrestler. And Taylor West is a very big, scary dude um, as well. And, you know, I can hear people chanting it. Probably the only time I ever got an LP chant. But, you know, very happy to have gotten one. And I can still hear it. And it was crazy. It was so loud. I hit him with a kendo stick and the place went crazy. I think he spat at me first. And that got them even more behind me. Hit him with a kendo stick and they went absolutely wild. And then, you know, hit him again. And that was insane. You know, the adrenaline was pumping. I remember before the show 
show, like a couple of lads had come, Chris had come up to him and be like, make sure you G him up. And I was like, you know, running around the ring after I hit him the first time. And not, well, not running, pacing around the ring, you know, getting hyped and looking at the crowd. And it was crazy. It was, I basically got to live out what the actual guys who do all the hard work and do the wrestling get to experience for 30 seconds. And that was awesome. Like I said, that was another childhood dream I had. For that little window of time, I got to be the center of attention very graciously. Everybody else involved was cool with it. And I always ran these things past people and said, is this too much? Should we dial it back? And, you know, everybody was, you know, very nice. and was like, no, that's cool. That'll add to it. It'll be great. And yeah, that little window, that's a cool moment. And that's something that when I'm an old man, or you know, if I have grandkids one day, you know, sat around my rocking chair, be like, hey, kids, let me tell you about the time that 200 people <laughs> chanted for me in Barrow. <laughs> Well, listen, you've done a lot when it comes to the history of KOW. That's why we call you the heart and soul of KOW. And then I was curious also, because we've talked a lot about the past of KOW. And one of the most important things of the past of KOW is Cloud9. And talk about why that was important. And it may not be important to a lot of people that may not understand what we're talking about, but especially for the KOW fan listening to this. Talk about what Cloud9 in the lounge meant. So, like I mentioned earlier, our original venue was the Cemetery Cottages, which had to shut down. So then we had to look for another venue, and Cloud9 was the one we eventually settled on. And to be honest, it was it was the best choice by far. It's a really cool venue. I think you've said you've watched a couple of the matches that are like available online, but you can't you get somewhat of a sense of what it's like. But basically, there's a stage which is a cool staging area. Then there's sort of like the dance floor area, which is where our ring goes, because obviously it's like sort of function room and they have musical acts stuff on there as well. So that's where the ring goes, and then there's there's space on the floor, which is where the majority of our chairs go. There's booths around the outside, around the back, and there's a big balcony that goes right around, which makes it look really cool. And obviously, where our hard cam is, you can't really see that, but there's a big balcony, glass fronted, and then there's a load of people up there. So it's on two levels. It's like, say, you know, we can get a lot of people there in there, you know, sort of 200 odd people, but despite that, it does feel very intimate. You know, when it's full, it's really loud. As people are letting in the show, you can sort of feel the energy in the air, you know, and sort of that buzz of excitement. And it's very cool. It's also conducive to guys brawling around the venue, which they do fairly regularly. People have jumped off the balcony, stuff like that. But yeah, it's it's a really cool venue. We're really happy with it because, and the thing is with Barrow as well, the problem is we have a 20 foot by 20 foot wrestling ring. And so when you've got that, you have to think, right, we have to think, is the ring going to fit? You have to have enough roof clearance, obviously, because, you know, you're going to have guys, you know, if they hit a superplex off the top row, that's, you know, 10, 15 feet in the air. And, you know, if so if you've got a venue of it, we're low ceiling it's not going to work but yeah it's been really important for us i think it's part of our identity at this point obviously you know if we had to move to another venue obviously we would do our best and make do and it was the same with the cottages when we moved we were all heartbroken when we moved because we loved that venue so much we've been there for such a long time but now it's it's definitely sort of an integral part of i think the kw experience we have fans who get there early because they know what seats they want you know they want to be at these chairs up here they want to get in that booth you know so we literally have fans who queue up an hour sometimes more before the show just because they want to get in to specific seats and stuff like that so yeah it's been really important the owners and the venue are really cool they're really supportive and everything so yeah it's, it's a really good venue and like I say i really the atmosphere in there is very good and i just think the layout of the room is very cool for a wrestling show it's not something you usually see unless you're talking you know when venues run sort of like the academies over here which you're probably not <laughs> they're not familiar with but it's like o2 academies which are sort of bigger in size and they usually have balconies but because they're bigger rooms they don't have the same atmosphere so we've sort of got that cool mix of the quite intimate close atmosphere with two levels with a balcony as well so it's, it's a really cool venue to run shows in although taking the ring up and down the stairs does suck but other than that <laughs> it's it's a really cool venue <laughs> yeah watching some of you guys matches on youtube and i have to say there was something about the venue that in a lot of ways reminded me of in a way the old ecw arena what it meant to ecw so i think that one of the things that the company had going for it when it comes to kow is that the venue itself and that was why i wanted to talk about that especially for our worldwide audience here as we have a few more minutes with the heart and soul of kow and that is alp alp has literally done it all for kow he's been in the ring even a little bit he's been a booker a promoter and most notably is also the general manager of kow he's also done some ring announcing like i said he has done it all we are honored to have him here on the sports report the number one global sports show here on sport and i am the number one global radio station and i am the host of the sports report the reverend tom bryce and we are talking all things related to kow with alp the heart and soul of kow alp i want to talk with you before we get into a couple of other 
your thoughts on KOW. And there's a wrestler that we've referred to a couple of different times here. We're really excited about him. And he's also along the lines of 2-Bit, where we know he's going to do bigger and better things later this year when wrestling resumes. That's the unhinged Will Carter. We haven't yet had on the unhinged Will Carter, but we'd certainly love to speak with him here in the near and distant future. And for our worldwide audience listening here on Sportinarium, what made the unhinged Will Carter stand out so much in KOW over the past few years? Well, when it comes to Will, I think what makes him stand out so much is he is, he's very unique in terms of KOW, in terms of his style, in terms of the way he moves. Again, similar to Bit, worked very hard. You know, he's, he, again, he's been training since he was 12, 13 years old. So again, I, I've literally seen him grow up from, you know, again, a bit of a shy, awkward teen, you know, that phase that all of us go through, you know, into growing into, you know, a young man as he is now. You know, one of the stories that I want to bring up about Will is, again, the same as, you know, the same as Tubit. He was ready for for shows before we would allow him on shows basically and there was a, an academy show match that was Will Carter and Rick Marcus which now you know could main event one of our shows very easily I don't want to say it was the first time they'd ever wrestled I'm sure they had wrestled each other before but you know obviously the academy shows you know it's 20 to 30 people family and friends you know the much smaller venue but that's the whole point is to give people experience is to get them in front of a small crowd get them some ring time you know and get them used to that experience because obviously you know if they just went from training to here you are in front of 200 people that's a big you know jump but yeah so will and rick had a match on an academy show and it, it was phenomenal like i remember myself craig collins nightmare taylor west you know all the sort of ogs of kow you know some of these guys were in train at the time we were all blown away by it we thought it was phenomenal i was literally it was so good we took them both backstage you know there was a little side room that we you know we used to use for stuff and i remember going in there with them saying lad that was built in like that could have like our academy shows are always like it's usually like wednesday before the show so it's a couple of days before the main show and i was like that match could have easily been on the main show like this weekend i was like well if you were 16 i'd be putting you on the show like it was that good <laughs> it, it blew me away and again and probably a little frustrating for will because you knew he had to wait for longer but that was definitely one of the moments where i was like he's something special and again you know with his character you know he took time to find it you know he wasn't always unhinged will car you know he had different names and stuff like that he experimented with different things i think he's definitely learned a lot from nightmare those two are sort of you know each one half of one whole you know he's a little bit weird he's a little bit out there but you know the fans absolutely love him he wrestles really hard he's really aggressive you know he is unhinged he does some mad stuff you know he does a you know like a handstand off the apron and things you know he does some moves that you know nobody else in KOW does and that's really helped him to stand out and just by his performances in the ring by his character you know his commitment to that character he's really caught on and that's the thing with KOW fans is you know sometimes it, it might take you a little bit to warm up to them but once the KOW fans are behind you and into your character they're 100% into you and 100% behind you he was the first one of those three to be showcase champion you know he was the guy who won it after Rick Marcus vacated after his incredibly successful run again I haven't seen him it's been over a year now since I've seen him in person you know again still keeping regular contact with him and stuff like that but again I'm, I'm very much looking forward to seeing him in person again and uh, being able to actually hang out and be within six feet of each other which will be nice but yeah again he works incredibly hard he's paid his dues a million times over you know and, and continues to be very very important and somebody who along with Tubit is and Lucas Neon as well those guys are the future and now the present of AOW but they can only go upwards from here basically Absolutely. And listen, again, they've done so much in such a short amount of time. So we got a very good feeling that the unhinged Will Carter is on his way to even bigger and even better things. So if he's listening, a huge shout out to the unhinged Will Carter. And then after talking with you on all the great things that KOW has done in the history behind KOW, everything that you've done in the business with KOW. I got to ask you then for a worldwide audience listening here in the sport and area, what are your goals here for the future of KOW? So personally, my goals are just to get back to her in a show. You know, like say we do our academy shows. So I don't live in Barrow at this point. I live a couple of hours away. So even before lockdown happened, you know, coming back for a KOW show was always a homecoming for me. And, you know, my favorite part of that was the venue we used for training for academy shows would be walking 
in, there's always be, you know, people running over, giving me a hug, saying hi. So on a personal level, that getting to be in front of that crowd again, that's a massive thing. But in terms of our goals, we're hoping that maybe we could run a show in September. That's sort of what we're very tentatively looking at. Again, you know, we've got to keep an eye on all the government guidance and, you know, we're not going to run a show until it's absolutely safe to do so. You know, that's our top priority. But we're hoping to be back this year. And then basically, I just want to pick back up where we left off. I think we were doing a really phenomenal job. Some of the, you know, the last shows we did before lockdown, I think were some of the best shows we've ever put on. You know, we were lucky enough to have some really great talent on. You know, Big Guns Joe was on the shows. Josh Terry been on our shows and people like that who are incredibly talented and really when we're back the big thing is we're going to be moving towards our 10th anniversary show this year will be our ninth anniversary show but i'm always as a booker somebody who's looking ahead the 10th anniversary show is the thing that i've got my eye on for more long term you know the fifth anniversary show in that rolled around we put a lot of work into that and making that our biggest show ever and then i think the 10th anniversary show is going to eclipse that um, massively but yeah you know we've still got a bunch of amazing talent you know we've all of our guys have got our dates for the year so so whenever we are ready to go again, you know, we're ready to go back at full tilt. I want to pick up where we left off, you know, reintroduce these characters to people who maybe haven't come to a show in a long time. I might come to the first show. And that's the thing with KOW. We've always been our own little thing, you know, up until the last couple of years. I think we were like sort of one of the best kept secrets in British wrestling. Not many people knew about us outside of our hometown. But I think, you know, our shows can stack up against many, many other company shows in the UK. So that's just what we want. Our goal right now is just to get back to doing what we do, which is point on great wrestling shows presenting local talent cool characters interesting and engaging stories for people like say ultimately that 10th anniversary show i want to be the best show we've ever put on and that is like say a long term short term that first show back is what we're all focused on and then like say long term the build to that 10th anniversary show 10 years it's insane we talked earlier about our first show and you know if you come up to us and said you'll still be doing these in 10 years you know and go over some of the things we've done in that time you know we wouldn't have believed it and there's no sign of it ending anytime soon we've had conversations before you know where it's been sort of like we'll keep doing this until we don't want to do it anymore but i don't think there's much risk of that ever happening so yeah those are the big goals i want to see some of our younger talent come through the ranks like you said two bit luke's neon will carter certainly are all in the future i'm sure are going to break you know they already have broken in the main event scene battling up the showcase championship and that sort of thing but i think all three of them are going to be contending for the heavyweight title at some point in the future before we close those three lads were some of the most popular guys on our shows two bit was the most despised you know he's the leader of the underclass which is probably the most hated group in all of kow they were responsible for ethan edwards leaving kow you know <laughs> they've, they've done some horrible despicable things will Carter's is massively popular Luke because Neon was has probably got some of the loudest reactions I've ever heard in KOW over our entire history. So yeah, I'm just excited to get back to it. We're not looking to reinvent the wheel when it comes to KOW. We know what worked for us. We know who our characters are, what our strengths are, what our weaknesses are. And we know what our crowd like. We know what they appreciate. And we just want to keep presenting that to people, to our loyal fans. Because some fans have been coming to almost every show since we first started running. You know, there's people who, you know, when we talk about the two bits, Will Cars, Lucas, Neons, who literally have been coming to academy shows since they were 13 14 and have seen them grow and that's what's cool you know is seeing that so yeah like i said those are our goals to carry on we have been doing get that first show back hopefully nobody gets hurt through being too worked up i'm looking at you rick marcus um, <laughs> and then like I say, and getting to the 10th anniversary show i know i'm gonna to need to have a chat with him before the show i know i'm gonna be like okay don't hurt yourself <laughs> please <laughs> but yeah so those are our main goals is to, is to just keep doing what we're doing keep getting as many people as we can keep presenting a quality wrestling product to a part of the world that for a very long time was was starved of any wrestling at all Corporate outlaw rick marcus i hope you're listening to this because alp just referenced you and i got a good feeling that we haven't heard the last of this one and we could talk about the cumbrian outlaw all day and we love the cumbrian outlaw rick marcus although i don't know how the kow universe is going to feel about him these days but i will say one thing the kow universe is going to be so happy and so excited to see everybody back in the ring and we are certainly keeping our fingers crossed it is going to be later this year we think we're almost there. We're almost there to normalcy. We're very optimistic about the future. We know that KOW is going to play a huge role in the UK wrestling scene, not just for later this year, but for years to come. So we're very excited and optimistic about the future. And I want to give a huge shout out to all 
of the talent in KOW. All of the past, present, and future of KOW. Nightmare as well, the unhinged Lil Carter, Lucas Neon, the War Machine, Craig Collins. Can never forget about the War Machine, Craig Collins, Ryan Smile, King Ryan Grayson, Sheriff Steele, even though we think we've heard the last of Sheriff Steele and KOW, but can never mention KOW without Sheriff Steele and Chris Ridgeway and so many people that have made KOW what it is. But most importantly, the heart and soul of KOW is ALP, and he has literally done it all. That's why we were so honored to have him here on the Sports Report to talk some KOW. In fact, we're so honored to have ALP on the show here. We're going to definitely be bringing him back on in a few weeks to talk about some of those great feuds and the history of KOW. So there's a lot to talk about when it comes to KOW. We know that how Conrad Thompson and Eric Bischoff have done 83 weeks with WCW's Nitro Streak overall in the ratings war. Well, we might have to do that when it comes to KOW and talk about some of those great feuds. But ALP, before we get your closing thoughts here, I know that there are so many moments in the history of KOW. We could probably list about 100 or maybe even 200 of those moments. For a worldwide audience, especially listening here on Sporting Area, I wanted to ask you if there's one or two moments that stand out most. It can be in your career in KOW or just in KOW in general. So for our worldwide audience listening here on Sporting Area, one or two moments that stand out most in your KOW wrestling career. Okay, so I'm going to be a little bit cheeky because I can think of three, but I've already touched on two of them, so I think that's acceptable. So um, <laughs> we'll keep, keep it short and sweet. But, but obviously, I already mentioned, you know, the big, the end of the triad storyline. So obviously, that was like, say, that was our first big storyline to the fact to I also actually have the triad logo tattooed on me as well. So I actually have two KOW tattoos at this point. <laughs> um, but yeah, that was... That was our first big storyline. And like I said, I sort of explained how that went. So I won't go over it again. But the show that ended it was called Riot. It was a really, really good show. Again, probably one of our best still to this day. And like I say, we so we had it was the 30 minute Iron Man match, Collins and Ridgeway, lots of drama. But the rest of the members of the triad got battered out of the building by the KOW roster midway through the match. Me and Taylor West had our confrontation where I got the best of him with the kendo stick. And you know, such high drama, tied right until I think three seconds. Craig Collins locked the knee bar in, Ridgeway tapped the place went ballistic you know people jumping out of their chairs insane reaction still one of the biggest we've ever had Taylor West gets dragged out of the venue kicking and screaming it was an incredible ending and what I remember is just again with KOW everyone gets involved I'm the booker and the promoter still to this day I'll set the ring up take the ring down lug it up and down the stairs lug the van everyone gets involved and the thing I remember most about that night is the immense feeling of satisfaction everyone had everyone on that show knew that we'd knocked out of the park we'd absolutely killed it and I I remember we finished taking the ring down we all walked home I, I can still like I can remember the feeling I can remember walking making jokes with you know literally still to this day some of my very best friends you know I remember going back to me and one of the other guys houses at the time and drinking so that's definitely one of them just like say I can still feel how that night felt and just the atmosphere and everything the second one I've sort of already mentioned is when 2-Bit Will Carr and Lucas Neon debuted you know those three are almost like little brothers to me and a lot of the other guys in KOW like say it was a locker room sellout everyone Sheriff Steele Rick Marcus Collins Nightmare you know if you can name somebody who was there from early on or has been there for a long time everyone wanted to see that match everyone was so proud of them they did an incredible job there was a lot of proud wrestling dads that day there was more than one tear shed not just by their parents you know by some of us as well so that one has to be mentioned too and then the final one is we have a young fan called Louie and him and his mum Janine started coming to our shows a couple of years ago they're both just disabled but they're lovely people and we've gotten really close to them as a company and Louis is an incredible fan like ridiculous like he tells me things about KOW that I can't remember <laughs> like you know he like <laughs> he knows about stuff from shows before he was coming to shows like he can tell me about the triad storyline and he was like free when that happened and wasn't coming to shows <laughs> so incredible ridiculous how much he knows about it and Janine and me and other people had had these conversations and we'd had conversations before about about how you know he's at school and you know sometimes he, he gets excluded from parties and other events and stuff and you know she's obviously talks about how he comes out of his shell at wrestling shows and she came to us and said i want to book a wrestling birthday party for louis and we said right cool we'll do it we'll start it yeah and straight away everyone okay because everyone knows him everyone loves him to death and janine as well they're regular fixtures you know they come into the show early because janine's in a wheelchair so you know she comes in a bit early so she can get in and get settled and everything 
you know, you see all the lads, Rick Marcus, you know, as much as he's a horrible person in the ring, you know, he, <laughs> he, everyone goes over, says hi, yep. spends time with them. And, you know, Louis' favorite wrestlers are Rick Marcus and Sheriff Steele. And so straight away, we're like, right, we're going to make this special. This is literally for Louis. It's not just going to be a couple of matches. Everyone's going to give it their all. So we went, I went to Janine and said, right, let me know what matches he wants to see. We'll try and do the best we can. And then, like, say, his favorite wrestlers were Rick Marcus and Sheriff Steele, who were a bit of rivals at this time, but for one day only, they put that on hold. And then so the main event was... Uh, I want to say it was two bit Hudson Payne and Andre Decker, who's another member of the underclass, versus Sheriff Steele and Rick Marcus. That match got set up earlier on in the show. And Louis' wrestling character is lunatic Louis. Uh, he's got a mask, you know, his mum's like made him a cape and everything, like his own little wrestling gear. Super cool. So we had a little segment and they were like, well, it's three on two. That's not fair. We need a partner. We've heard there's a wrestler called Lunatic Louise. And so he's their partner. So in the main event, he was obviously, you know, he wasn't getting in there and exchanging wrist locks and you know headlocks and suplexes but you know he was there with me he was on the apron at the end he got tagged in then Rick and Sheriff picked him up he stuck his legs out like so for like a drop kick and he did like a running drop kick and he pinned two bit to win the match and you know he got lifted on the Rick Marks and Sheriff deal you know his two heroes shoulders all his school his class were there you know like say that sometimes he felt excluded from and a part of and, you know all of them were cheering and chanting his name so that will always have for me and I think everyone at KOW is part of that special part place in our hearts because we literally got to make that kid's dreams come true he's an awesome dude you know for that period of time he got to feel included and special and you know part of something cool so yeah again has to be mentioned again very small you know there was only 40 people there his family and friends you know so the majority of the KOW fans didn't see that moment but for everyone involved you know Rick will tell you Sheriff Steele will tell you you know that was a day that everyone at KOW will remember and when we are back because the show was called Louis Mania Louis Mania 2 will be happening we definitely want to do it for him again in the future but yeah that was a moment where you know one of those days where it was a long day i'm not gonna lie you know we had to <laughs> get up early load the ring in the van unload it at the venue put it up run the show take it down take it back you know it's, it's a whole day's process but everyone did it you know everybody volunteered their time you know nobody wanted money for it everybody was just doing it because it was for louis you know so that was one of those days that makes you think you know when there's days when people pull out with shows or something goes wrong you know or it's stressful you know that was one of the times that is like this is completely worthwhile you know every single moment of it w has been worthwhile so yeah those are the three that immediately spring to my bike set there's so many we could talk about and hopefully we will talk about at some point in the future we are definitely going to talk about those moments and we talked a little bit with Rick when he came on the show last month about what Louie has meant to KOW and that's why ladies and gentlemen a rising tide lifts all boats and Louie has definitely been that rising tide for KOW and KOW has been the rising tide that has lifted so many boats and that's why we're extremely excited to see everybody back together later this year and that's why we know that KOW plays a role in so many people's lives not just about who wins and who loses it's not just about how many championships somebody has yes it's great we've seen what Sheriff Steele has done yes it's great that we've seen what Rick has done even too big or Chris Ridgeway, I and mean, we can go down the list. But what matters most at the end of the day is the difference that you can make in the lives of others. And ALP and the rest of KOW have definitely done that and some. And we cannot wait for Louis Mania too, because what you're going to do when Louis Mania runs wild on you? And we can't wait for that. <laughs> we cannot wait to cover that and all the latest happenings when it comes to knockout wrestling with the heart and soul of KOW, that is Booker, promoter, ring announcer, general manager. He's even dabbled in some ring skills, and that is ALP. And that's why we're honored to have him here on the Sports Report to talk all things related to KOW. For you, my friend, I want to give you the floor. I want to give any closing thoughts. I also want you to plug where our listeners can keep up to date with you and all the great things that you're doing. And I also want you to plug all of the great KOW social media. So please plug anything related related to KOW, whether it's Twitter, whether it's Instagram, Facebook, anything that we can keep up to date and find out when KOW is returning. And even most importantly, find out why KOW has been one of the premier wrestling companies in the UK over the past eight years and find all those great videos, all those great clips, all the great things that this company has done here in Barrow and for the UK. So for you, my friend, I want to give you the floor. Anything you want to share to the KOW universe, anything you want to share to our worldwide audience listening here on 
Sport and Area. Also, please plug all of your social media and plug all of the social media related to KOW so we can keep up to date and find out more when KOW returns. So I can't thank you enough and the floor is yours. Well, first of all, thanks very much, Tom, for having me on. And also, I think you should be thanked as well for having so many sort of underappreciated wrestlers and promotions, giving people a platform to talk and tell their stories. So just on a personal level, because, you know, a lot of the people who had on are people I've known for a very long time. So you deserve a lot of credit for that as well. So I just want to mention that really quick. So, yeah, in terms of myself, I do some streaming on Twitch. So you can find me ALP Streams on Facebook, Twitter and Twitch, if that is of anybody's interest. Twitter I do also use as my personal Twitter too so there'll be some wrestling related stuff from there as well you can find us knockout wrestling on facebook ko underscore wrestling on twitter and k underscore o underscore wrestling on instagram we also are on youtube you can search for that just knockout wrestling and actually a bit of an exclusive for you here tom is there's so much activity on that recently but our journalist lucy simons our official kow journalist at the end of 2019 did us a top 10 best matches list and editing has just started on those matches so in the near future those top 10 matches matches will begin to go live so if it has piqued your interest if you do want to see more of some of the great talent we've mentioned some of the best matches of our last year of active action youtube and facebook and the twitter and the instagram as well are the best places to be because those are going to be getting released in order from number 10 to number one so like say if you do want to see the very best of kow then that is going to be coming up very soon and you can sort of get introduced to us, see what we're all about and also whet your appetite for when we do come back so a little bit of ex- an exclusive for you right at the end Ladies and gentlemen, I think we have why we're going to bring on ALP here next time because we're going to be recapping the history of some of the top 10 KOW matches. So I think you've pretty much answered when we're bringing you back on, my friend, because we cannot wait to watch those matches. We cannot wait to recap those matches with you. So I think we got a game plan. So obviously, you know how to promote. You are definitely a very good promoter. So clearly, you understand the marketing power of the Sports Report ordinarium and what it can do to talk about all the great things related to KOW. So I think you've answered when we're bringing you back on next. So I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to talking some KOW. And obviously, it's a tremendous honor to have you on the show. I can't thank you enough for all the great things that you've done for the wrestling community, especially in the UK. And I want to give a huge shout out to all of those wrestlers that have been in KOW that have come on the show here. And I'm sure we're going to be talking to them once again in the near and distant future. So huge shout outs to them. And my friend, I'm looking forward then to having you back on very soon because we're going to have a lot to talk about here when it comes to the past, present, and the future of KOW, starting out with number 10, it looks like, in all-time great matches and promotion history. So looking forward to doing that with you, and I can't thank you enough. Yeah, thanks once again. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. We've barely scratched the surface, so yeah, definitely looking forward to uh, chatting more in the future. Looking forward to it as well, my friend. And that's why we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show with the heart and soul of KOW. And that's the booker, promoter, and he's been the general manager and the ring announcer for KOW. And that's A. P. As I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryce, and stay tuned for some brand new music from the legendary Joe Dell, a pretty big wrestling fan in his own right. So stay tuned for some brand new music from the legendary Joe Dell of Sleepy Hollow. So if you like it hard, you like it heavy, you like it loud, you're in the right place as the legendary Joe Dell is going to play us some brand new music. As we're here on the Sports Report, the number one global sports show, we're just with the heart and soul of KOW Wrestling, and that's Booker and Promoter of KOW. W-A-L-P, as I am the host of the Sports Report, the Reverend Tom Bryce, and we're here on Sportinarium, the number one global radio station. Stay tuned for some brand new music from the legendary Joe Dell here on the Sports Report.